This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. Sorry I had to delay the release of this podcast by a few days, but I've been a little bit under the weather. A commercial-free version of this podcast is available on Patreon for $1 per month. Patreon.com forward slash Beyond Contempt Podcast. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. Most people think of the perpetrator in this case as the original school shooter, but there were a few others before her. This case was hard to navigate due to conflicting accounts and opinions of the people who knew the shooter. The media didn't do a great job of fact-checking, especially the accounts from fellow students, which were sometimes embellished. The shooter's facts also morphed with each of her parole hearings. If you're listening to Episode 16, Brenda Spencer. On December 12th, 1954, 19-year-old Dorothy Nadine Hobel married 25-year-old Wallace Edward Spencer. Dorothy received a bachelor's degree in business, with additional coursework in accounting from Woodbury College in Los Angeles, California. She worked out of a home office, which was unique for that time. Their first child, Scott Matthew, was born in 1956. Their daughter, Teresa Lynn, was born in 1958. And their third child, Brenda Ann Spencer was born on April 3, 1962. Dorothy and Wallace had dramatically divergent personalities. Wally was a shy man of few words. Dot was outgoing and spent most of her free time hauling their children to extracurricular activities. Not surprising. When people are so dissimilar, it's hard to make a marriage work. Add infidelity to the mix, and the result was a contentious divorce. Wallace stepped out on their marriage and was seeing other women. He wanted to move into a bachelor pad for a year, and then move back in with Dot later. He, in fact, had already rented the apartment. When Dorothy found out, she filed for divorce in 1971. In court, she requested custody of all three kids, child support and alimony. Dorothy made $3,700 per year, while Wallace made $9,500 per year. The court awarded alimony to Dorothy. Wallace had to pay her $200 per month for two years, then $100 per month for three more years. $200 in 1971 will be worth over $1,200 today. The judge met privately with the Spencer children to find out who they wanted to live with, and he awarded custody to Wallace. The two oldest children chose their father. Brenda was also sent to live with Wallace because the judge did not want to break up the family. Dorothy kept their family home in San Carlos, California, which was just east of San Diego, and Wallace bought a new house a few blocks away. Dorothy had visitation rights, but there was not any information reported on how long she maintained consistent contact with her children. The memory can be a fickle creature. It is something that is less accurate over time, and is subject to personal interpretation, which is the central theme that runs through this case. Everyone who knew or was part of the Spencer family, has a different memory of their relationship dynamics and behaviors. Brenda's attorney, Michael McGilm, said Dorothy at no time attempted to spend time with her kids and never forged a meaningful relationship with Brenda. Conversely, Brenda's lawyer described her father as a resentful individual who disliked humanity. Of course, Brenda's lawyer developed his opinions by speaking with Brenda. Others have described Wallace as a loner who was not interested in forming relationships with people. His co-workers described him as likable, but on a professional level. Dorothy said that she visited Brenda often. Brenda said that she went to her mom's house, waited on the porch for her mom to show up, and was met with indifference. Dorothy's mother remembers that Brenda cried every time the visits with her mom ended. Dorothy described Brenda as a happy, well-mannered child who did well in school. She thought of Brenda as her little girl. But once Brenda's parents divorced, she withdrew from the activities that had given her pleasure. She quit playing softball, soccer, bowling, and golf. In June 1973, Wallace wasn't able to maintain his alimony agreement. It was reported that Wallace and Brenda were living in near poverty and sleeping on a single mattress together. 
In May 1974, he asked the court to end his alimony requirement. He also wanted $150 per month in child support from Dorothy for the three children. Even though Brenda had given up extracurricular activities, her dad would take her on hikes in the mountains on the weekends. Wallace gifted her a BB gun and took her target shooting. Brenda really gravitated toward shooting. She would practice for hours in the family's backyard, usually shooting at tin cans. At age 11, a neighbor scolded her for shooting at birds with her BB gun. Brenda said that she was only trying to scare the bird and not cause any harm because she liked animals. She had dogs, cats, turtles, and various other pets during her childhood. She even had a snake, just like her idol, Alice Cooper. Brenda even thought she might be a veterinarian one day. By the time Brenda turned 16, she had bright red hair that sat on top of her thin, 89-pound frame. If you ran into Brenda on the street, you would never think that the tiny, shy girl was a prolific markswoman. But by all reports, Brenda was an excellent shot and was very careful with her gun. She knew how to safely handle, care for, and carry guns. One of Brenda's best friends said that she was a fantastic shot. They went into the desert, where she never missed shots taken at lizards or squirrels. High school's a time when teenagers stereotype their classmates and embellish the truth. And many of Brenda's classmates did not know her that well, because she didn't have many friends. It was especially clear, later on, that Brenda also had a loose relationship with the truth and did not live in reality. It's hard to differentiate fact from fiction, but many of her peers shared their opinions to the press after the incident. One of Brenda's friends said that she had dreams of becoming a sniper. Other classmates said that they were afraid of Brenda because she talked about killing things and they thought she was crazy. Another person said Brenda talked about getting high and shooting pigs, but people didn't take her seriously. A student who shared a history class with Brenda remembered her talking about how it would feel to shoot people. Brenda wanted to be famous and bragged that she was going to do something big to get on TV. She made battle plans and prepared for a siege by digging a fortress in her backyard. One boy who was a grade older than Brenda said she was a thin, straggly-haired girl who got in trouble for not showing up to school. He thought she was weird but mostly harmless because she kept to herself. Brenda's neighbor said that she was a quiet girl who was looking for attention. Brenda's high school teachers said she was an introvert. Her English teacher called her harmless. Brenda enjoyed photography class and was even complimented by one of her teachers. She was talented enough where she won a color TV in a photography contest. Other than photography, there were a few other things she liked about attending school. Brenda had excessive truancy issues and other behavioral problems. They referred her to a school for problematic kids for a while, but later on she returned to her original high school. In 1978, during summer vacation, they arrested Brenda for shooting out windows at Cleveland Elementary with her neighbor Brent Fleming. Later that fall, she was arrested for burglary and shoplifting. In December 1978, Brenda's social worker referred her for a psychiatric evaluation for depression, and she had shown signs of being suicidal. She felt isolated from her parents and her peer group at school. Brenda only had one female friend who stopped hanging out with her because she was not interested in boys. Her older sister had moved out of the house, and her older brother was rarely home. On December 20, a psychiatrist recommended that Brenda be hospitalized because she was a threat to herself and others. Her father would not go along with the hospitalization plan. Later on, Wallace would look back and claim that Brenda was so happy that she even cooked dinner that Christmas. That was the same Christmas in 1978, where he gifted Brenda a Ruger 1022 series rifle with a telescopic sight, just five days after meeting with the psychiatrist. On January 29, 1979, Wallace made a brown bag lunch for his daughter, and he went upstairs to wake up the petite 16-year-old girl because, as usual, he needed to drop her off at school. 
Brenda told her dad that she wasn't feeling well. It was her time of the month, and she'd always had debilitating cramps. So he told her that it was okay to stay home, and he left for work around 7 a.m. The night prior, Wallace noticed that Brenda went out to their van and brought in a bunch of her dirty clothes. Wallace didn't realize that there were 700 rounds of 22 caliber ammunition concealed inside of Brenda's dirty laundry. It was now 8.30 a.m., and Brenda had the house to herself. She retrieved her gun and ammo, smashed out a window in her house, and began shooting right after the school bell rang at Grover Cleveland Elementary School, which was located across the street from her house. Children fell to the ground and were bleeding. Initially, the adults at the school didn't know where the shots were coming from, but they quickly figured out that it was from one of the houses across the street. The 53-year-old principal, Burton Ragg, ran outside and attempted to help the children. He tried to direct the uninjured kids to safety and attended to the children who were hit. He was shot in the chest as he ran towards a wounded girl. The custodian and World War II veteran, Mike Sukar, whom the children called Mr. Mike, ran outside to help the principal. That is when he took a bullet and went down. Teachers got most of the children inside as bullets flew past their heads, but two injured kids were still outside. Robert Robb and Dennis Dormus were the first policemen on the scene at 8.45 a.m. Robert was assessing the wounded when a bullet ricocheted off his bulletproof vest, nicked his jugular vein, and lodged against his spine. He was lucky and survived despite the location of the injury. The shooting stopped when a security guard from a neighboring high school took possession of a garbage truck and parked it in front of the elementary school, obscuring Brenda's view. The shooting lasted 15 minutes. The wounded children were safely placed into an ambulance and taken to the hospital. There were eight children wounded in total. Monica Selbick, age 9, left flank. Mary Clark, age 8, abdomen. Greg Werner, age 8, buttocks. Crystal Hardy, age 10, left wrist. Audrey Stites, age 7, left elbow. Christine Burrell, age 9, abdomen. Julia Robes, age 10, flank. And Charles Miller, age 9, shoulder, with the bullet entering only an inch away from his heart. Principal Ragg and Mike Sukar succumbed to their injuries. All eight children survived. Monica Selvig and Christine Burrell had the worst injuries and were in the hospital for weeks. Around 9 a.m., reporters Gus Stevens and Steve Wiegand from the San Diego Evening Tribune looked up phone numbers in that neighborhood, and they struck gold with the first number they dialed, which happened to be the Spencer residence. Brenda picked up the phone. She told the reporter her name and age. When Steve asked if she knew who could have done this, Brenda responded, Yeah, who do you think is doing the shooting? She promptly hung up the phone, so they called her back. The reporter asked Brenda why she did this, and she said, I don't like Mondays. This livens up my day. I just started shooting. That's it. Did it for fun. Reporter Gus Stevens said there wasn't a hint of remorse or sorrow in her tone. She promised the reporters that she had more shooting to do, but never ended up firing another shot. The reporters' actions might have been seen as interfering with a police investigation, but their call also helped distract Brenda enough to buy police time to get everyone evacuated from the elementary school. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. As you all know, following true crime cases is my thing, but even I need an occasional break. So when I feel like I need to take a break, my go-to refresher is the mobile puzzle game, Best Fiends. Best Fiends is a puzzle game that you can play right on your phone, and it's really neat because you go through all these levels, solving challenging puzzles that actually engage your brain. I just made it to level 43, and I only started playing on Christmas Eve. The great thing about it is that it doesn't take up much of your time, but it's great in that it fills up those moments where you wish you had something to do, aside from scrolling through Facebook over and over again. The other day, I was a passenger in the car traveling to my in-laws for the holidays, and the trip was taken forever, but having this game to play made the time go by much faster. You also don't need an internet connection to play it, 
so it's convenient for when you don't have any connection, like on an airplane, for example. The game is also visually stimulating, with its bright colors and cute characters. And Best Fiends updates the game monthly, with new levels and events, so it never gets old. Best Fiends is a 5-star rated mobile puzzle app on the Apple App Store and Google Play, and you can download it for free. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Now, back to the show. Brenda had a six-hour standoff with the SWAT team. The San Diego city manager, the police chief, hostage negotiators, over 100 police officers, and both of Brenda's parents were called to the scene. When Brenda was on the phone with the negotiator, he asked her why she did it. Brenda responded, I have no reason. I want to have some more fun. It was fun seeing kids being shot in a group. She also told them that she hated people her entire life, including her parents. Brenda said that it upset her that Mr. Mike, the school's custodian, was trying to save the children. She also claimed that she consumed beer, whiskey, pot, and downers that day. When negotiators asked Brenda if she had a message for her parents, she said, Tell my dad to get screwed. Regardless if she was truly inebriated or sober yet detached from reality, the notion that this incident was playing out like a show on television enthralled Brenda. Brenda's favorite TV program was SWAT, which was a 1970s-style police drama. Brenda wanted to ensure that she would be handcuffed and given a lawyer, just like on TV. Negotiators cut the electricity off from her house right around 12.30 p.m., which Brenda seemed to take pleasure in. Negotiators promised her a Whopper meal to entice her into giving up. She warned the police that she would come out shooting, but eventually surrendered without incident, just after 3 p.m. She unloaded her rifle and pellet gun, just like they had agreed upon. Brenda walked out of her house, laid her weapon on the ground, and surrendered. When police searched the Spencer home, they found 36 empty casings, two live rounds, two knives, and a small bottle of Southern Comfort that was three-fourths empty and was missing a cap. When Brenda was interviewed, she proclaimed that her heroin use started at age 10, and she said she often consumed alcohol. Her family members confirmed that Brenda had an occasional beer, but she wasn't a heavy drinker. And Wallace never brought alcohol into the house since he was a recovering alcoholic. Police drug tested Brenda, and she was negative for both drugs and alcohol. The detail of the near empty Southern Comfort bottle was never sufficiently explained by the authorities. The police interviewed Wallace, and his story was that everything had been normal. He said that Brenda had been upset over the divorce, but it had been eight years, and he really wasn't sure what drove Brenda's actions. When Brenda's old next-door neighbor and friend, Brent Fleming, was interviewed, he said that Brenda would sometimes take pills or drink. They were obsessed with Alice Cooper's album, Billion Dollar Babies, and played Kiss's quintessential teenage rebellion song, Flaming Youth, from the Destroyer album. They wanted to set the world on fire. Brent and Brenda made plans to kill a cop. Brenda also told him that she had big plans for Monday. Brent said that they always said things like that, but there was never any real follow-through. A private investigator had revealed that Brenda was enthralled with Me, Alice, which was Alice Cooper's autobiography, and instructed Wallace to inform Brenda's attorney, as it may have aided in building an insanity case, especially in the 1970s. Wallace never told the defense attorney about the book, and claimed he forgot. He may have been overwhelmed with Brenda's situation, or he might have been worried that revealing the book might strengthen the civil case against him. The shooting was heavily publicized in the media. They interviewed anyone and everyone who had ever interacted with Brenda Spencer. It seemed as if there was little fact-checking that went on. Some reports said that she had carried a can of lighter fluid, intending to set fire to the tails of stray dogs and cats, or that she was usually on pot, pills, or LSD. The media coverage impacted what happened in the courtroom. They held Brenda in juvenile hall, and she was not offered bail. There were questions over if a 16-year-old Brenda Spencer should be tried in juvenile or adult court. The backlash was palpable. People threw eggs and rocks at Wallace's car and home. Brenda's first attorney made up an excuse and quit. 
It later surfaced that he received death threats because the press reported that Brenda might be tried as a juvenile and therefore could be released quickly. The judge then ruled that the press be banned from the fitness hearing, which, in the end, determined that Brenda would be tried as an adult. Since she was only 16 years old, she would not be subject to the death penalty. On March 19, 1979, Brenda was diagnosed by EEG with epilepsy. She received this temporal lobe injury from a bicycle accident, where she ran into a pole two years prior that resulted in her blacking out. She originally pled not guilty, by reason of insanity, but changed that plea to guilty with two counts of murder and one count of assault with a deadly weapon. Brenda's lawyer felt that the medical evidence, which linked her seizure disorder to violence, wouldn't hold up in court. Wallace and Brenda Spencer were sued by the nine survivors and the families of Burton Rag and Mike Sukar. They settled the suit in October 1979 for $350,000, which was small, even for 1970s standards. On April 4th, 1980, Brenda Spencer was sentenced to two concurrent terms of 25 years to life under California's then indeterminate sentencing laws and was sent to California's Institute for Women. An indeterminate sentence is a sentence imposed for a crime where there isn't a definite duration and only offers a range of time. Many factors are considered before an inmate with an indeterminate prison sentence is paroled. This might include recommendations of the judge and the prosecutor, length of time served, the offender's entire criminal history, the risk to public safety, the offender's participation in prison programs, their infractions while incarcerated, and the victim's information and wishes. Brenda's many parole hearings were an ever-evolving story of avoiding blame, mutating facts, and purported memory loss. In 1993, she did not attend her first parole hearing. Brenda's attorney read her statement, which said that she was under the influence for days prior to the shooting and had consumed uppers, downers, PCP, and alcohol. She claimed that the prosecutor had independent lab results conducted from the same blood sample that the police tested, and the results found that she had potentially lethal levels of drugs in her system, but they withheld the results. Brenda said that she was hallucinating and thought the students were commandos in paramilitary gear. She didn't remember what she said on the phone to anyone that day because of the drugs and whiskey. Brenda said that anyone who knew her believed she wouldn't hurt anyone. She took responsibility for causing the deaths and emotional suffering, but followed that up by saying that she wasn't a murderer. Brenda raised doubts about who fired the bullets that killed and injured people. She claimed that the SWAT team lied about how many bullets they shot and in what direction they fired. Brenda said that she was massively drugged with psychotropic drugs when she went to juvenile hall and that she didn't understand the plea bargain that she took. At the California Institute for Women, Brenda was part of a group called Women Prisoners Convicted by Drugging. These women documented that they were prescribed psychotropic drugs while they were navigating their criminal trials, and it was being investigated by the FBI and DOJ. The parole board was not sympathetic because they were not in the business of relitigating her case. The board felt that she lacked remorse and would be a danger to the community if released. The prison psychologist assessed Brenda as having an antisocial personality disorder with narcissistic features. The board believed that Brenda's actions were premeditated, and they pointed out the inconsistencies in her statements. The board told her that they could never consider her for parole until she could openly discuss and come to terms with her actions in 1979. During the 1994 parole hearing, Brenda maintained that she had no memory of the shooting. She opted to not participate in therapy, but she finished her high school education. She received additional education in animal grooming and electronics. She also took part in an AANA program. The parole board decided that she was a risk to society, and parole was denied. In 1988, Brenda withdrew her request for release minutes prior to the start of the parole hearing. Charles Miller, one of the child victims, was scheduled to attend. At her parole hearing in 2001, Brenda said that she didn't remember the phone call with the reporters. When they read back the transcripts of the reporters' recollections of their conversation, Brenda said it was the first time that she had ever heard of it. Brenda thought her father gave her a gun because he wanted her to kill herself, which was something she had stated since the shooting in 1979. 
She insisted that she had asked for a radio for Christmas, but he bought her a gun instead. In an interview, Brenda's father confirmed that she did not ask for the gun for Christmas. He bought it for her because he thought that she was ready to have one. After the divorce, she felt neglected by her parents. That hearing was the first time that Brenda alleged that her alcoholic father beat and sexually abused her. Brenda planned to live with her mother in San Diego if they released her. Her father visited her in prison regularly. Brenda stated that she had to share a bed with her dad until she was 14. In interviews, Brenda's mother confirmed that this sleeping arrangement happened. Wallace claimed that they shared a bedroom, but not a bed. Brenda said that her and her father were now friends and have come to terms with their alleged abuse. She took responsibility for the shooting and remembered only shooting into the parking lot while waiting for the cops to show up and shoot her. Brenda clarified to the parole board that she wasn't aiming at anyone and the whole incident was actually a suicide attempt. Brenda's psychiatric report said she was emotionally unstable and did not have a good grasp of her past actions. She had poor judgment and dealt with stress by self-mutilating. Brenda had tattooed the words courage and pride on her own chest by applying a heated paper clip several times. Even though Brenda was treated with antidepression and antipsychotic medications, she could not handle everyday stressors. The report said the prognosis for her returning to society would be poor. The parole board decided that she was not ready to be released. Although Brenda had received exceptional marks in prison, they decided that she had not sufficiently participated in self-help and therapy programs. The board also thought that she lacked a realistic parole plan and had no employment prospects. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. Hi, everyone. I wanted to tell you about BetterHelp Online Counseling. It's an affordable service where you can connect with one of their 3,000 U.S. licensed therapists. You can find counselors that specialize in anxiety, depression, stress, relationships, trauma, grief, or LGBT issues. I work from home and don't often like to leave my house, so I really appreciate that you can communicate with your counselor from the privacy of your own home via text, chat, phone, or video. So if you've been thinking about getting counseling, there's never been a better time because Beyond Contempt True Crime listeners will get 10% off their first month with a discount code Beyond Contempt. To get started today, go to betterhelp.com slash beyond contempt. Fill out the questionnaire to help them determine your needs and get matched with a counselor that you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash beyond contempt. Now, back to the show. In 2005, Brenda had another parole hearing. This is a subsequent parole consideration for Brenda Spencer. Adam, would you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. All right. Inmate repeatedly fired a 22 caliber rifle. When asked about the motive for the shooting, the inmate told her, I just started shooting for the fun of it. I don't like Mondays. This livens up the day. How you feel about this? You've been in prison for quite a while. Uh, you killed two people. Again, you wounded nine others. How do you feel about this? I'm very deeply sorry I did it. And I didn't have a right to do that to those people. This was sniper-type behavior. There were approximately 36 rounds fired at 150 feet from a telescopic rifle. She was shooting in a very deliberate manner to harm and to kill. Brenda remembered small parts of the shooting, but didn't remember the specifics. Do you remember much about what occurred? Not a lot. I'm I'm sure I did it. I just don't remember everything in sequence. Do you remember the shooting itself? I don't remember the shooting itself. You don't? No. Right. I, I don't remember it, but I'm sure it happened. I'm sure I did it. Brenda's injury story changed. She said that she played headlight tag with oncoming cars when she was five and a half. Brenda dodged a car, ran into a wall, injured her eye, and started having short-term memory loss besides the temporal lobe epilepsy injury. Brenda said that the bike accident was a lie made up by her father and that her injury resulted from abuse by him. Both of Brenda's siblings and mother witnessed her bike accident 
So this was an untrue statement that Brenda had given the parole board. When Brenda was originally arrested, she said that her heroin use started at age 10. But now she changed that story to pot smoking, which began at age 12. When her brother Scott was interviewed after the incident, he confirmed that Brenda experimented with pot. Brenda learned skills while in prison and was striving to become marketable. Do you think you're going to have trouble finding employment when you leave? No, I don't. Why not? Because I have marketable skills. What kind of skills do you have? What would you like to do upon release? I'd like to drive the forklift. You'd like to drive the forklift, what you're doing right now? Yes. From the moment that she was taken away from that home, Miss Spencer has thrived. She spent the last 26 years of her life uh, improving herself, uh, not just to comply with the board's recommendations, but to gain marketable skills and to try to ensure her success once she is released. She conceded that her prison tattoos were an act of self-mutilation. Spencer has self-identified as being gay since birth. And the self-harm coincided with her girlfriend's release from jail. Why courage and pride? And that's not actually what it says. It's written in runes. Okay. And I think they made a mistake when they read it. Okay, what does it say? It says, I'm forgiven and alone. Brenda said that she had no contact with her siblings and had not seen them in a long time. Brenda's father said that her mother would take her if she were released. But Brenda hadn't been in contact with her mother for some time. Obviously, your father was given custody of all siblings. Did you get to see your mother much? Not a lot. What was your relationship with your mother at that time? Well, sometimes I'd stop by her house, but she didn't much seem to care to see us or anything. Okay, but she wasn't able to get a letter to us this week? I thought you told me you weren't in contact with her anymore. I haven't been lately, well, but in the there? past I have. It's been about five years since I talked to my mom. Five years? Mm-hmm. Her father made the five-hour round trip to prison and visited weekly. Now, in regards to your family, are you still in contact with any of your family? I'm still in contact with my father. What's your relationship with your father? We've gotten to be friends. And that was not the case when you were younger? No, when I was younger, we had a lot of problems. There's a lot of abuse. What do you remember in regards to abuse by your father? I remember being hit in the face a lot, being hit in the ribs, being um, yelled at, called names. Well, I remember him coming home from work and being all mad and smacking me in the head. And, I don't know, different nights when he would just almost rape me. When you say almost, what do you mean almost? Well, it was like that, like he did. I don't understand. Like he would um, touch me inappropriately. I don't know how to say it. Her original statement of her father sexually abusing her changed to her father had sodomized her. Did your father perform sodomy? And did that lead to digital penetration? Yes. And later into intercourse? Yes. So are you now indicating that there was actual intercourse involved? It was... Um, I guess you'd call it sodomy. Have you ever discussed this with your father? I've tried to. All right. And I don't when get anywhere. Well, did you ever confront him? I confronted him. What did you say? He just doesn't want to talk about it. The psychiatry report said that Brenda was more stable, but that stability was relatively new and the doctor was less than fully supportive of her release. Brenda tried to show remorse for what she did. I realize that nothing I do and no amount of time will bring Mr. Rag or Mr. Sucre back. It won't erase the um, 
the fear and stuff that I've given to those kids, Mr. Rob. I just want them to know that I, I'm very sorry. And I don't know how to make it up to them. But I try every day to make myself a better person so that, because I don't want anything this horrible to ever happen again. While the parole board had thought she had grown, she wasn't ready to be sent back to the same situation as when she committed her crime. The board was concerned with her memory loss, which she didn't claim at the 1993 hearing, but had ever since. All right, we have all returned. At this time, the panel has come to a decision. The motive of the crime was inexplicable or very trivial in relationship to the offense. Unfortunately, this world is filled with things that should never happen to children. However, that does not allow them to perpetrate violence on others. I know how difficult it must be for you, Ms. Spencer, to be able to come out here in front of all these people and talk about something that you have kept silent for so many years. I think Ms. Spencer has made a breakthrough. I think it's important because one of the most dangerous things that we ever have to deal with is a crime that has no understanding whatsoever. She is attempting not to be that person that she was that many years ago. This is not a life without possibility of parole. She does have the right to be reviewed. It is not reasonable to expect that parole would be granted in the next four years. Good luck, Mr. Thank you. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. At the parole hearing in 2009, Brenda spoke in depth about all the abuse that she had suffered. She asserted that her father admitted to abusing her and has apologized. Brenda's siblings had never seen her father abuse her. Her mother can't say for sure, but she suspects abuse went on because of the behavior changes she saw in her daughter. However, this hearing was the first time where Wallace's credibility came into question. Sheila McCoy was Brenda's roommate in Juvenile Hall and had been released to a halfway house. She ran away from the halfway house, and that's when 50-year-old Wallace got Sheila pregnant. Wallace married the 17-year-old girl prior to Brenda's sentencing in 1979 to avoid criminal charges. Sheila was five months younger than Brenda and had such a striking resemblance to her that detectives thought Brenda had been released from prison. The couple had one daughter and lived in the same house across the street from the elementary school. Sheila left Wallace shortly after they were married, and also left him with their daughter. At this parole hearing, they revealed that Brenda had been medicated for and diagnosed with a schizoaffective disorder. She didn't remember talking to the reporters that day, but admitted that it was entirely possible she said those things. Brenda said she committed the crime because she wanted to commit suicide and claimed she wasn't aiming at anyone. Brenda's attorney said that the drug screening performed by the Center for Human Toxicology had detected alcohol Integritol, in her test on the day of the incident, and there wasn't a screening test for LSD in 1979. Brenda had concrete parole plans and received an acceptance letter from a halfway house. She had a letter from her mother offering help with food and medicine. There was a letter from her dad offering help with clothes, food, transportation, and finding a job. She had a first-time letter of support from her sister. Brenda's job plans included either working as a forklift operator electronics repair technician, or upholstery technician, because she was certified in all three areas. The reports on Brenda were more positive, showing that her parole plans were workable and she seemed employable. They still considered her a moderate risk for violent recidivism. It was essential that she remained on her medication and avoided antisocial peers, weapons, and homelessness. Charles Miller testified in person again. They denied her parole, because the board believed that she still posed an unreasonable risk of endangering the public. It's still unclear why Brenda Spencer shot people that day, and some people have speculated why. One child psychologist believes that Brenda's actions stem from a sense of total helplessness. Children like her have no sense of identity, and see others in the world doing things that they cannot do. 
They fantasize about having power, so there is no way to know if the shootings were premeditated or if Brenda lost touch with reality because she lived in a fantasy world. A psychoanalyst who studied teen murders believed that violence-prone kids don't form real attachments to people. They don't feel like human life is worthwhile, including their own. Then there's also her schizoaffective disorder diagnosis, along with an antisocial personality disorder with narcissistic features. And psychopathy is a common feature in school shooters. The psychopath lacks empathy and is antisocial. They aren't concerned with the truth and only say things that benefit themselves. Brenda had that bike accident when she was 14 and had abnormal brain scans afterward, which is also seen in psychopathy. The more we learn about traumatic brain injury, the more we understand that it can play a role in people becoming violent. Brenda was eligible for parole in 2019. It's unclear if the hearing took place because no reports have been published. She will be eligible again in 2021. Many of Brenda's victims want to see her locked up forever, and Burton Rag's daughter and wife would be happy if she received the death penalty. One of her victims, Mary Clark, has mixed feelings about Brenda being released. Mary worked in a psychiatric hospital and understands why Brenda did what she did. Mary believes that Brenda never received the help that she needed. Brenda's mother went on record to say that Wallace was responsible for the events that took place. She thinks that he and Brenda should trade places in prison. Wallace has always denied abusing his daughter, and he also denied ever stepping out on his marriage. In an interview, Wallace also says he does not feel responsible for the shooting, even though he bought Brenda the gun. He passed away in 2016. The only real answer that we have for this tragedy is that Brenda really didn't care for Mondays. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. A band called the Boomtown Rats wrote a song called I Don't Like Mondays, which was based on what Brenda told the reporters. Columbia Records had planned to release that song in the fall of 1979, which coincided with Brenda's trial. And if you haven't noticed, the phrase I Don't Like Mondays is written on the wall in the movie The Breakfast Club. I want to give a big thank you to new patron Brenda D, who joined at the $2 per month level. All Patreon money goes directly to paying researchers, which allows me to produce episodes faster. Also, it's better not to use the Patreon app to get your commercial-free episodes because their app is pretty janky. You can instead take the RSS feed that they send you via email and paste it into your podcast app of choice. Please visit beyondcontentpodcast.com for links to the sources used in this episode. This episode was researched by Laura Delgado. Script writing, editing, and all audio production were performed by me. If you like the show, please leave me a favorable review in Apple Podcasts. And thank you so much for listening.